Hi everyone, welcome back to Foreign and Film, and today I am bringing you something extremely special. I am very honoured to be able to bring you some pre-release coverage of The Last of Us. Now, this is, in case you are wondering, a completely spoiler-free preview of the series. This isn't speculation of what I expect to see. I have been, I am entirely grateful to Sky and to HBO who have allowed me to watch the series before it is released to UK and US audiences. So what I am able to do is go through some little tidbits about the series, give you my views on the series, and there are certain things that I'm not allowed to do. As a fan of the games, I am extremely excited to be able to do this. There are a couple of other things that I'm going to do as well once the episodes begin to be released. But before we get into all that, uh, I just want to give you a bit of a synopsis for anyone who's not familiar with The Last of Us. So The Last of Us, uh, the story of The Last of Us takes place 20 years after modern civilization has been destroyed. We see Joel, a hardened survivor. He's hired to smuggle Ellie, a 14-year-old girl, out of an oppressive quarantine zone. And what starts as a small job soon becomes a brutal, heartbreaking journey as they both traverse the US and depend on each other for their survival. You may be aware that the series stars Pedro Pascal as Joel, Bella Ramsey as Ellie, and then amongst other cast members, Gabriel Luna as Tommy, Anna Tov as Tess, Nico Parker as Sarah, and Nick Offerman as Bill. So many other characters that I'm going to allude to in this preview. And again, this is completely spoiler free. Um, I don't want to ruin anything for anyone. And uh, to be fair, I am embargoed to do so. So just to kind of give you a bit of a summary of what I can't say. So I need to be remain i need to remain mindful of significant plot points in the series uh, in this particular preview hence why it's completely spoiler free full episode recaps will happen on the channel and on the uk uh, on the podcast feed i should say um but they are embargoed until each episode is aired in the us so what i am plan to do is every monday I am going to release a full episode recap. Now, the reason why it's in a Monday is because, obviously, my followers will know that I am based in the UK. Now, the UK episodes go up on a Monday night at around about 9 a.m., uh, 9 p.m., sorry, but that is following a live stream with the US at around about 2 a.m. Monday morning. I'm not going to watch those episodes at that time, so I'm going to watch them once again on a Monday afternoon once I get back from work. I'm then going to write some things down. I'm going to come into this room. I'm going to record some episode recaps with Ollie, who has been on the channel before as well. And we're going to basically do spoiler-filled recaps when we get to that point. So what I can't give you in this video is um, spoilers of significant plot points. I'm going to mention certain things that do happen. And I'm not going to give you uh, full episode recaps because that is going to come later down the line. So the things that I can say. Now, I just want to start off by showing that I am a fan of the game. I'm a fan of both games. I'm a fan of the series. And while I've not been with it for too long, um, I played the, the first game, the PS4 remaster of it, last year for the first time. And I've purposely replayed it again recently over the past few weeks um, since Christmas, specifically the PS5 remake. And what I wanted to do with that is just obviously see what the remake was like, but then play it ahead of this series so that I could be consciously thinking of where they were going to recreate certain set pieces, where they're going to recreate certain things about the characters and about the storylines. So one thing to mention on that, I'm a fan of the game. I'm a fan of the, the game series. So that means I had certain expectations going into the series. And I think other fans out there will have their own expectations because I did as well. Expectations in terms of things that I'm assuming are going to happen how the story will go. There's this overwhelming feeling as I was watching the episodes of recognising where things were going, where things were happening, seeing Joel and Tess go through the quarantine zone and knowing that the next thing that would happen is that they'd meet Marlene and then that's when they'd pick Ellie up and sort of feeling a little bit too ahead of the game, essentially. Episode one does away with any such expectations. It takes the origins of the story, specifically Joel's story, much further than it did with the game. We see much more of Joel's relationship with Sarah. We see much more of Joel's relationship with Tommy as brothers before the outbreak happened. The writers, I think, 
trying no or were knowingly thinking that we were going to see some sort of expectations or foresee some sort of expectations and they play with what the knowing fans will expect to see next and they try and throw a few curveballs in there which I think was a brilliant decision to keep us on our toes because there were certain things where in my head I'm thinking oh this is about to happen and then they throw a bit of a curveball in there. It doesn't quite happen in the same way. It doesn't happen at all. Something completely new happens. So again, it's not just a carbon copy. We've lifted this from the games and we're going to follow it and we're going to adapt it here. A uh, couple of actors that I just want to mention, obviously the main two, Pedro Pascal. I thought his accent was superb. Now I know Pedro Pascal from The Mandalorian. Um, I really enjoyed him last year in The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. He reminded me so much of Joe, of Troy Baker's Joel in that he was very cold. He is a man who previously wore his heart on his sleeve and now he's trying to do his best to not show emotion. He is plagued by loss. He has moved on with grief, he thinks, but then he's still having to sort of traverse this new world with a grief-stricken identity. And he very much previously wore his heart on his sleeve and now he's trying not to wear his grief on his sleeve as he goes through and does that. Bella Ramsey is such an embodiment of Ellie. She's sassy, quirky, ahead of her time, headstrong. She's still a child. She's still trying to find enjoyment in all of these different things. And it's really sweet to see the innocence and the naivety and some of the actions that she has in specific episodes, especially in scenes that we see with her and Sam and in scenes that we see with her and Briley. And I'm going to come to the Left Behind DLC in just a little bit. And between those two, between the Joel and Ellie, titular sort of, uh, not titular, but sort of main relationship, it pitches it perfectly, just like the game did. It's so well developed across the episode. You know, you start off with Joel being really sort of cold shoulder towards Ellie, not wanting anything to do with him, sort of palming her off on Tess. And then over the episodes, they just get closer and closer and closer. The music to speak about, so Gustavo Santaloa, who did the score for the game as well, he was on board for the TV series, he did parts of the score for the TV series, and it, and as with the game, it plays such a pivotal part in creating that atmosphere of the show, just like the game did. To speak about the infectors a little bit, so one thing that I do need to mention is that the episode screeners that I had access to, one and two were complete in terms of VFX and things like that, Everyone after that, so episode three onwards to the series finale, which is episode nine, were incomplete. So there were some things that were kind of there and done, and there were some things that were almost renderings. So I'll give as much as I can I can do on that, but I am very much looking forward to watching these episode back so I can see the complete CG and I can I can see the complete sort of the intention ultimately. So the clicker sound gets under your skin just like it does in the games the the the, there's one specific episode and i think the fans of the game will know the sort of sequence that i'm speaking about with joel tess and ellie where they go into a museum and the sound of the clickers just being in the background the fact that they are the the sort of lore around them that ellie is aware of who they are but she's never actually met a clicker before and she's she's just heard of this infected that can do something through the sound and can listen like a bat and that's all in there as well uh, it's not a spoiler because it's in the trailer but the bloater appearance and everything around it in that specific episode was impactful enough but again it was one that I had with incomplete CG so I'm really looking forward to seeing what that looks like full, full sort of completion I suppose it is and again, I can't wait to see how that's intended. There's been a lot online over the past few days about spores and about how the spores aren't included. The spores aren't included. The spores aren't in the TV series. And again, I completely agree with, I think it's what Neil Druckmann has said, and I think it's what Craig Mazin have said, in that if you were to have different scenes in the series where both characters are fully gas-masked up it's going to be difficult for us to hear what they're saying. It's going to be difficult for them to sort of muffle that dialogue. You're going to get into like Bane territories here of like hearing what people are saying. But what they do is they replace it with tendrils. Now, I've done a little bit of sort of reading into this and to wondering what tendrils are and things like that. Tendrils are the kind of veiny looking extra parts of, they're, they're very plant-like, they look very plant-like, but they are disgusting the way that they are represented in here now 
what they try and do, and this is all the cordyceps mutation, is the infected have them in their mouths and the tendrils are sort of moving out of their mouths and it's almost showing that parts of the cordyceps infection can just move on and mutate through the tendrils. And I think that perfectly replaces the spores. I know the spores are a big thing for fans of the game because it was such a big pivotal part of the game in certain set pieces, but they've done it a service here by including the tendrils. They've just not completely forgotten about it. To speak on the horror, one thing that struck out to me about the, the horror of the game was obviously you're expecting the infected, you're expecting a zombie show, you're expecting a zombie game. You get infected, you get those sorts of things, you get the different way that they're moving. We speak, we see the clickers, we see the blowers. There's definitely a lore around how these things are um, in the world. But then the, it's the horror of the survivors, it's the horror of the actual people who are in these situations and the people who are so desperate to survive and they begin to turn on each other. And there are certain episodes later in sort of the later half of the season where Joel talks about his experiences of, um, there's, there's a certain set piece in the game where he says that he was on both sides and they talk about how he's seen people and he's seen what people are capable of when they are desperate to survive. And there's almost a horror in that as well. There's, there's Fedra in the background of all times. There's a, a new supporting character called Kathleen, who I'm going to come to in a minute, who again... The, the, you know, they all sort of silently lead on things with a sort of tragic personality behind the eyes. You can see what they're trying to do. You can understand their motivations, but ultimately the, there's more horror in their actions than these mutated, infected, who are just trying to mutate even more people. You can tell that I'm trying to, told the line I suppose expanding the narrative now this is something that I was very interested in so the writers and the developers who developed the world of The Last of Us they've fully brought that into this TV series and there are additional character motivations there are enhanced personality traits and there are deeper histories Joel, Ellie, Tess Tommy, Marlene Ellie's mother and Ellie's birth, very significant scene. Even smaller characters like Robert, Bill, Frank. Won't say any more on that. Sam, Henry, even the Cordyceps virus itself. And again, not to give specific plot points away, but the series starts with a little bit of a foresight into what the Cordyceps virus could be. And it sort of takes us back in time and then brings us forward again. Kathleen, this additional character that was mentioned. So Kathleen's not in the game and she pops up in episode three and she is running an anti-Fedra establishment as an antagonist. She's very softly spoken. She looks like a plain, ordinary, everyday citizen, but is very ruthless in her directions and her orders to people. It took me a minute. It took me a minute to sort of see her and go, oh yeah, this is a bad guy. But then as well-rounded as she is, we get to see her character develop. We get to understand her motivations a little bit more. We begin to understand why it is that she's doing what she's doing um, and the sort of dystopian leader that she's become. Uh, a very interesting inclusion here. Um, David's inclusion, so if you're a fan of the game, you'll know more about David, and I'm, I'm just going to leave it there, felt much more like the Seraphites that are to come with part two when they adapt part two it was very kind of i am this all knowing leader everyone will listen to me i'm bringing these people together and i began to wonder whether they were going to soften parts of david's character i think people who are aware of the game might know what i'm talking about and they don't but yeah yeah maybe maybe the seraphite feeling that I got was an intentional thing for future seasons because ultimately we know that we're going to see them and again like Druckmann and Mazin have spoke about how when it comes to them adapting season two it's not just going to be a one season and done thing um, this is a one season and done thing in terms of the adaptation of the game 
But I think when they come to part two, there's much more that they can do and there's much more that they can do over a number of different seasons. Um, I tweeted something this week um, that the the Last of Us account tweeted a picture of Sarah wearing her purple T-shirt from the opening and from the first episode. And the attention to detail is outstanding. And I'm saying this with the game fresh in my mind and watching these episodes, taking what we know, recognising it from the game and staying true to it. T-shirts, set pieces, things that haven't just been replicated, they come to life in the show. Even the smallest sounds, down to things like replicating the medikit sound. There are times when like, Joel is sorting himself out and th- that sort of re- instantly recognisable sound of you've pressed L, uh, R2 and down while he's sort of wrapping himself up and you can hear the tape and things like that. The, um, a couple of little ladder Easter eggs that I really liked in there. And I feel like everything's been so meticulously thought through. This is the producers not wanting to do right by the fans are not only wanting to do right by the fans this is them not doing it just for the sake of it and trying to make a quick book if you like me i got a kick out of every single time i heard a line of dialogue that i recognized from the game there were certain parts of the lines of dialogue where i was finishing the character's sentences because i knew what they were going to say and i wasn't seeing that as sort of lazy shorthand of oh we've just copied the script from the game i was seeing that as that's so good that they managed to get that line of dialogue in there and obviously it's not just directly lifted there's more to it they've explored more things to it but every now and again just getting something in there ellie's joke book getting that in there as well uh was very good and what took me by surprise and again i can't specifically say what but you will know what when you see it in one of the sort of middle episodes is they are already incorporating elements of part two and what is going to come in a later season into this season. There is, I think, a very specific Easter egg in episode seven, I want to say. It's either seven or eight, which I will definitely mention when I do a full episode recap, which I thought was very, very clever and had me sort of going, oh, but then, yeah. And then there's something prior to this where we get invited into somewhere and I thought, that looks a bit like... And then in my head I clicked and I thought, oh, yeah. So what they're doing is they're showing us now, knowing that we're going to come back to that in part two. Cryptic, I apologise. Some quick tidbits about episodes then. Episode one is the setup and the exposition. It will terrify you and it will break your heart episode two throws you straight into the world and there are a few episodes where we take a break from the ellie and joel narrative and relationship to get introduced to a couple of additional characters so we get bill and frank and their story beautiful we get sam and henry their story some slight changes but interesting in the way that they've done certain things Left Behind gets its own episode, essentially. It's kind of bookmarked by the sort of ongoing narrative of the series, but then we get Ellie and Riley's story and its own little vacuum, if you will. Um, There are some emotional sucker punches along the way in the form of some very recognisable needle drops. And if you're a fan of the series, you'll probably know what songs I'm talking about. And... I tell you what works really well. And again, I'm not going to get too much in depth with this. There is a song in episode three that is then popped back up again in a different version in another episode. And I went, oh, I can't believe they're using that song again. That's emotion. That's getting me. And I confused it with it being in the game and it's not in the game. So the fact that they were able to do that between those episodes, power to the storytelling, power to the screenplay. I particularly enjoyed a look into Joel's mental health that comes later in the season. And again, that's all I'm going to say on that one. Um, Episode six is definitely the for your consideration episode. That is the episode that is going to get submitted to awards voters and the clips that they'll use of Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey when they win their Emmys next time round. That's all I need to say. And 
I suppose, just in case anyone's interested, the finale is the shortest episode. Read into that what you will. Um, closing points, then. How I feel about it, generally. The Last of Us is a masterclass. It's a masterclass in how you bring video games to the screen. Many would worry about an adaptation being lesser than or not successfully retelling the source material, but this is just as good as the game, which we all know is no easy feat. It's that good that if you wanted to delve into the world of Ellie and Joel, that if you woke up one morning and just thought, I'm going to play a bit of Last of Us, you now have something else to go along with that. You don't have to stick in the disc. You don't have to download it. You don't have to install it. You don't have to go to your PlayStation. By all means, you can do. But if you wanted to just sit and watch, this is exactly it. This is this is an addition to the world. This is a complimentary companion, a superb supplement or supplement. This is a perfect partner to one of the greatest video games ever made. It's like a cinematic DLC. And it's more than that. It's it's terrifying. It's emotional. It builds on what you already know and gives you more. If you like the series, if you love the series, if you love these characters, you're going to love this. If you like the series and you're thinking, oh, well, they never, never quite do it right, try and go in with an open mind. Don't assume that they're going to do certain things. Don't assume that certain things are going to disappoint you because they won't. Yes, there are things in there that will be familiar to you. And my instant thought was, and maybe this is how people who read books feel when they go and watch films and TV shows because they, they feel like they know the narrative. I felt I know this, I knew this backwards. And watching it, I very much enjoyed the twists and turns that they took. I very much enjoyed the differences of the characters, the different things that happen. And again, I can't recommend this enough. So to give you a bit of a sort of blurb as to where this is going to happen. So the HBO original drama series, The Last of Us, based on the critically acclaimed video game of the same name, developed by Naughty Dog, exclusive for PlayStation platforms, debuts on Sunday the 15th of January at 9pm ET and PT on HBO and will be available to stream in 4K on HBO Max. That's another thing, actually. Can't wait to see this in 4K. Beautiful. Um, and then for us in the UK, The Last of Us is exclusively available on the 16th or from the 16th of January on Sky Atlantic and on the streaming service now. And there's going to be nine episodes, like I say, one every single week. And I'm very much looking forward to watching these again and bringing you full episode recaps. So make sure that you, if, you, if you're new here and you're just here for this, click subscribe and then you can come back and listen to all of my episode recaps um, and they're going to be spoiler filled. So at that point, you can leave your comments. You can tell me what you thought as well. You can tell me certain things that I picked up on, maybe even certain things that I missed, because I will tell you this, there are Easter eggs along the way, people. And I can't wait for fans of the game to see it. And I can't wait to tell people who have no idea about the game to go and watch it, because I think it's in that effective of a drama that people who haven't played the game are going to enjoy it. And the reason why I'm getting Ollie on here to do these spoiler recaps is because he's not played the game. So I'm intrigued to see what he thinks about it from a bit of a layman's point of view, if you will. Um, yeah, I've tried to cover all bases. I can't give anything away. Again, once again, thank you so much to Sky and to HBO for letting me do this. It's been an absolute privilege. It's been an absolute honour. I have bashed out the nine hours of of content in the past two days just so I can make sure that I get this to you as soon as I can do. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Again, if you're new here and um, because you've just, just found The Last of Us content, hit that subscribe button, um, like it, rate it, share it with all your friends. The next videos are going to be purely Last of Us videos. They're all going to be weekly episode recaps that are spoiler-filled probably no longer than about an hour if me and Ollie can stop talking for long enough. Um, everybody else knows the drill. If you want to help the, the podcast, go to our sponsor, Offworld Tees. Use the code FARAND, that's F-A-R-R-A-N-D, for 15% off your order. Go Come and follow me on Twitter, at Adam Farrand. That is the only Twitter account now. And as usual, stay safe, look after each other. Set those reminders, set those record buttons, whatever it is that you do. 
15th of January in the US, 16th of January in the UK, The Last of Us on Sky, on HBO, on Sky Atlantic, on Now, and on HBO Max. Thank you very much once again, and I will see you next time.